Okay. <laughs> what that message meant. I don't know. I've never been on the other side to see, okay. you know, what, what okay. it means. So now that we're recording, I can start, correct? Oh yeah, I guess it is. Yeah, it's recording and we have two You're members. Attending. And we have all the members present who are coming, right? Okay. So um, good evening, everyone. Welcome to the January 11th, 2023 meeting of the Amherst Historical Commission. Uh, I am the chair, Robin Fordham, opening this meeting at 6.33 p.m. Um, and uh, I am opening this meeting in accordance with the provisions of uh, MGL Chapter 40A and Article 3.60 of Amherst General Bylaws. Uh, oh, no, I'm reading the wrong thing. <laughs> I knew that was going to happen. <laughs> Where's the other? Uh, no, you sent it to me, Ben. I mean, you sent me two legal notices and I pulled up the wrong one. <laughs> Let's see. I don't, I don't have it immediately in front of me either. Okay, right hold on. Let me just see if I can grab it from my email. Apologies, everybody. I did start doing all of this at six o'clock, but. It's your first time. It's I know. Time. Okay. <laughs> uh, uh, uh. Oh, there it is. Preamble. That's what I needed. All right, there we go. The preamble. All right. Pursuant to Governor Baker's March 12, 2020 order suspending certain provisions of the open meeting law, GL3, uh, GLC 30A, Section 18, and pursuant to Chapter 20 of the Acts of 2021 and extended by Chapter 22 of the Acts of 2022 uh, and extended again by the state legislature on July 14, 2022 and signed into law on July 16th, 2022. This public hearing and public meeting of the Town of Amherst Historical Commission is being conducted via remote participation. Members of the public who wish to access the meeting may do, do so via Zoom or by telephone. No in-person attendance of members of the public will be permitted, but every effort will be made to ensure that the public can adequately, adequately access the proceedings in real time by technological means. A hyperlink to the hearing will be post is posted on the town's online calendar. Uh, do I need to read anything else, Nate? Well, it's six thirty-five, so I think you could read the legal notice. Okay. I mean, you. I mean, most of it was kind of summarized there, but I guess we could start with the you know the notice of public hearing. Okay. Uh, so um, that was what I was reading before, correct? Yeah. Um, it was so I think we could just um you know the describe the two hearings okay and, yeah and just open them okay uh so we are um having two public hearings this evening uh one uh regarding 117 Amity Street uh Donald Fisher and Susan Haas a request to demolish an attached one car garage and replace with a new garage that is wider has new door siding windows trim and a dormered roof in front and back and second, uh, 214 Pomeroy Lane, uh, Amherst Poor Farm LLC, a request to demolish large timber frame barn and replace with a new barn. Um, so with that, I would be opening the, I'm opening the public hearing for 117 Amity Street. I know uh, there's two members or one person here. Uh, I'm, uh, Zinnia, I'm promoting you to panelist and then you can join the commission. Good evening. Hi. Thanks for joining us. Thank you. So can Zinnia go ahead now? So, uh, Zinnia, I'm, I'm new to the chair role, so uh, <laughs> pardon me while I make my way through this. Yeah, so typically we ask the applicants if they want to make a presentation or have anything to share. I mean, I could share the screen too as well. It, the plans are available online. I don't know, Zinnia, if you want me to pull an image up or if you want to do that, you have the ability. Uh, yeah, um, let's see, I can, oh, uh, so it would be great if you could pull up, um, the demolition plan. Um, yeah, let me just, I'll share, first I'll share the image of the, um, let's see, I'm, I'm just in my Chrome, in the Chrome browser. So the, let's see. 
Where are we here? Sorry, I'm going to bounce around for a minute. 17 Amity. So just for everyone to see, here's an existing image of the garage. Mm -hmm. so this, this is you know, just from uh, this wall over, mm -hmm. supposed to be demolished. Yeah. And for, maybe it's this is the document to see. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Is that visible for everyone? I can make it a little bigger if we'd like. Looks good to me. Yeah. Right. So, oh, now, now it's a little. <laughs> I'm moving. I'm moving here. So here's the, um, you know, the garage outlined here in this little box. Mm -hmm. um, I, don't, yeah. I can't. I can't tell what people see or don't see, but um, yeah. Yeah, I could see. Yeah, yeah, we can see. We can see the plans. Mm -hmm. All right. So, you want, is that good, Zinnia, or do you want to go? Yeah. I mean, we're lo we're looking to demolish the existing garage structure so we can rebuild it to look the same, but work properly and be new. So it'll be a little bit. It'll be about three feet wider, and it's going to have a little, you know, little balcony off the end, but. You know, basically, it's it's falling apart as it is. The foundation is completely uh, broken, and so we're we're looking to get your approval to demolish what's there, so we can put a new one in. Okay, great. Did you have any other comments? Uh, I don't. I don't think so. Okay. Um, so, Nate, do I open up discussion for our questions? Yeah, I mean, I I can provide a little bit of yeah uh, information. So, you know the this house is con a contributing structure in a national register district. So it's um, considered significant. And now, you know, it's the commission's role to determine if the changes will be, you know, detrimental or somehow, um, you know, kind of inconsistent with the structure in the context. So what I'm showing here is the proposal to build a new garage. So it would have clapboard siding here. I'm with a dormer on the backside Here's the east gable end, uh, which will look a little different, but you know, same. They're trying to match the slope of the dormers with the existing house. You know, line up the um, height of the of the roof, and from the front, it will look pretty similar um, down here with dormers and a garage door. Uh, there'll be some a few wall lights, and um, what was had changes that where this window is shown here. There'll be actually a door with a balcony. Um, and I will say the local historic district commission reviewed this, uh, the other week and they approved it. So they, you know, they didn't find anything, um, you know, they found it to be appropriate. You know, they had some minor conditions, nothing that dealt with the demolition or anything, but they, you know, they approved it. Um, I have a question. We've seen this before. It seems I'm having a sense of deja vu. But... Yes, we've seen it before. I've, yeah, that's I've, what I thought. I remember it. Yeah. 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 I'm I'm totally behind this. <clears throat> yeah, so what happened, this was um, presented before and then essentially it expired, it lapsed. And so they're back again. And so it's not. Oh, okay. okay. Yeah. yeah, so the, you know, right now with the bylaw, for instance, if this were to be approved and uh, permit wasn't, wasn't um, taken out or if it was and then it didn't happen, you know, it wasn't uh, acted on within six months and there wasn't an extension, then it, you know, it's essentially it follows the building permit uh, guidelines after this, okay. right? So, yeah. okay. so is there anyone on the commission who um, was not on the commission that the point that it was reviewed before for, for whom this is new? It's new to me. Okay, so do you have any questions or comments, Madeline? No, I think the drawings and renderings make it quite clear to me. Okay. I know I had asked, um, I think I'd asked in the past whether the doors were salvageable or reusable. Um, and I, I believe that they weren't, but uh, yeah. I would wonder um, if the material for this dormer window, uh, for the shed dormer, mm -hmm. the new shed dormer, wow. if that will be, it's it's so similar in shape and dimensions as the dormer in the existing building, like immediately. 
adjacent to it. Mm -hmm. Are those materials going to contrast or will they be, will you try and sort of match them? They're, they're going to match as, as closely as possible. We have replaced um, some of the windows near near there, actually the ones in the at the front door where the little bit of um, uh, railing is. We've replaced all of those, uh, I think we did that about three or four years ago. Um, so they will look identical to those, those windows um, and they will be as similar as possible to the historic windows. That's nice. It's nice to know that they're so similar. So it's not a juxtaposition, really. Yeah. Any other uh, questions for the presenter from the members of the commission? No? OK. Um, so having no further questions, I believe this is the point where I would close the public hearing. Is that correct? By a vote? No, we, I'd keep it open and ask if there's any public comment. Oh, okay. I would keep yes, it open and ask if there's any public comment. Um, so if there's any public comment at this time on 117 Amity Street, uh, I believe what, you raise your hand or I can't remember what the um, telephone prompt is. Right. And, yeah, I forget what the telephone prompt is too. But yeah, so I think the, I don't see any hands raised. Okay. And then, um, yeah, if the commission doesn't have any other questions or comments, we don't think we need any new information, we could close the hearing. We could have a motion to close the hearing and then have a deliberation uh, after. So do I have a motion to close the public hearing for 117 Amity Street? Yes, from me. Ready? Do you have a second? I'll second it. Okay. okay. All right. So uh, all those in, or no, we're going to do a roll call vote, I think, mm -hmm. uh, to close the hearing. So um, I'll start with Becky. Yes. Okay. Uh, Madeline? Yes. Patty? Yes. And I vote yes. So at uh, 645, we close the meeting, the uh, public hearing for 117 Amity Street and open uh, the commission up to discussion uh, about the matter in front of us, which is a request for a demolition permit for this garage. Um, I'm just going to start quickly to uh, say that um, last time and this time, um, well, I think the redesign is a good one. I uh, appreciate the fact that the Historic District Commission has approved it, and I have no objection. I agree. I agree. I agree. Okay, is there any other discussion or should we move ahead to the vote? In which case we will again need a motion. We'll need a motion to uh, issue a demolition permit for 117 Amity Street for the garage. I'm happy to make that motion. Okay, Hetty. And a second? A second. Okay. Um, so again, we'll go with a roll call vote. This is a vote to uh, per, uh, issue a demolition permit for 117 Amity Street Garage, uh, Donald Fisher and Susan Haas. Um, Madeline Helmer? Um, yes. Patty Startup? Yes. Becky Lockwood? Yes. And I also vote yes. So that is a four to zero for permission or for issuance of the demolition permit for 117 Amity Street. Thank you for coming to our meeting. Thank you. Yeah, thanks. Yeah, so we'll work through that. Um, Zinni, you can reach out to Jen or you know, I'll try to get something going this week in the in the OpenGov permitting software. So great. Thank you. Great, thanks. Okay. okay. So now I have to open the public hearing for 214 is separate. I open a separate separate public hearing, correct? Right. Okay. So uh, I'm at 647, I'm opening the public hearing for 214 Pomeroy Lane, uh, Amherst Poor Farm LLC, a request to demolish a large timber grain barn and replace with a new barn. Uh, if there uh, is a member, if there are, if the applicant is here to make a presentation, they could be admitted to the public hearing. Yeah, Ryan and Sabina, I'm, uh, I will promote you to panelists. And whoever would like to speak. Um, if 
Good evening. Hi. Good evening. Hello. Is uh, Ryan here? He is. Here. Oh, good. All right. I, did, I can't see you. Um, well, I'll make a, a quick presentation. Um, we purchased this land in 2019. Um, it's just next to where we grew up, and it was always a farm. And they were going to develop it into 14 um, homes. And uh, so we um, purchased it with the intent of, uh, of, of returning it to its uh, original um, purpose, uh, at least since the 40s. And that is uh, as a farm. And uh, the barn, it's, it's since we came on, on board, it's been um, derelict, if, if, you, if you will. And uh, it's, it's at a point where it's really quite unsafe um, for, for people to be in it. We've sealed it shut. And um, we are um, working now with right builders to uh, seek a demolition. And um, we have the plans for the, uh, for the new barn, which is going to really be a production facility um, in the same square footage and same sort of, uh, what do you call it, the same footprint. And uh, it's going to be with geothermal and solar and high efficiency, um, just to be sort of a, a standard for uh, farms of the future. Um, hope to be, we're working with Many Graces Flower Farm, and we've also um, uh, got a forest management plan for the land that used to be uh, also part of the farm, but now is uh, a forest. So. That's, uh, I think, the long and short of it. I think we're just seeking uh, the rights to demolish it uh, simply because it's, it's of no use to a, a future farm that needs to use it for a completely different function than um, cattle and little chickens and so forth. Okay, thank you. Did um, Ryan want to add anything? I think you, uh, Sabina, made a good point. You know, we've actually, we've looked at ways of trying to salvage uh, any of the materials here. Um, they're kind of beyond repair. We expect that we may be able to use some of the siding and possibly some of the uh, framing. Um, but for the most part, uh, it, you know, the materials are beyond their use at this point, unfortunately. Okay. Um... Do we get a public comment at this point, Nate, or commission? Or usually staff and then some commission discussion okay. or questions. Okay. So, staff. so you know, I, I, um, yeah, I mean, I put some aerial, older aerial photographs in the packet um, just to um, show that I, I can share the screen in a second. Um, you know, so this was determined to be significant um, just for, you know, a few reasons. Uh, the Pioneer Valley Planning Commission, a few years ago, we asked them to look at outbuildings um, that could could have some history. And so this was one of a hundred that they identified. You know, they didn't actually inventory it. They, um, but they said, you know, so here's an, a 56 aerial photograph. I'm assuming this is the barn, you know, things have changed slightly, but you know, this was a, you know, an active, you know, early to mid 20th century, 20th century farm in South Amherst. Um, here's a 1939 aerial photograph. So whether or not it's the same structure, but there was something here uh, back in the 30s. Um, so, you know, so in terms of a significance, you know, there's, um, you know, this is, a was an active farm um, for a long time. Here's existing conditions that were uploaded today. There's some additional photographs. Thanks, Ryan. And so uh, just, you know, if we scroll through these quickly, you can see the condition of the structure is, is really deteriorated. And so a neighbor actually ha has written a letter that was um, sent today, um, you know, actually saying she's glad this will be removed and that a new barn would be going up in its place. Uh, I'm just in case the commission members hadn't seen that. So, you know, I do think there's probably been years of neglect um, with this structure. And, you know, I, in terms of history of the, of the, um, property, I think that was mentioned a little bit that it was, you know, the poor family from Standard and Poor, 
you know, it was a farm. There's not a lot of, um, this property wasn't inventoried. So, you know, there's a lot of inventory forms throughout town, but this property was never had a form B completed. And there, there's really not a lot of what I could find um, through a search of some special collections and other things, photographs or, you know, a written narrative of the history of family here. Uh, you know, just, it's just some aerial photographs from the 20th century. Um, and so, you know, and it's not visible, too visible from the street. Um, I was just gonna share some interior photographs. And so here's, you can just see from the interior, the construction of it, it's kind of a hybrid and the balloon framing and I'm not even sure how structural some of the posts and beams are, but. Um, Was it a tobacco barn? It's so, interesting. I, I think at some point it, it might have been used for a little bit of tobacco, uh, a yeah. minor amount. Um, yeah, because there are some hinged doors mm -hmm. on the outside yeah. or hinged um, boards. Right, we thought maybe, you know, obviously some animals, maybe. Um, Growing up, it was a cattle farm, right. uh, but it was really a gentleman's farm. I think that's what I was trying to um, imply. Um, this was a family that was based out of New Jersey and, you know, wanted to have a little farm and they had a, a little farm. Um, yeah. What sources um, did you consult for the background on their um, uh, standard and poor history? That's really interesting. Uh, well, um, when we were growing up, my father used to pause and say, uh, you know, the farm next door, the poor farm, that's standard and poor you know oh, it was wow. we always knew uh it was in the 40s that they purchased it and purchased land from various neighbors um you know sort of post-depression period so that they grew the the farm area a little bit and yeah that's what they did they had cattle and, and when we were growing up in the 60s and 70s it, there was still some some cattle right Um, should we take, oh, 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 go ahead. I'm not sure who that was. No, okay. Um, so do we go to public comment at this point? Maybe? Yeah, I guess if there's, unless there's any more questions or comments from the commission. Okay. Commission members have any questions or comments for the presenters? No, oh, okay. So in that case, we will go to public comments. There's one attendee for another later agenda topic, but, if, but I'm not sure there's any hands raised for this right now. Okay. So in that case, we can bring the public hearing to a close uh, by motion. Do I have a motion to close the public hearing for this property? Is that Becky? Okay. Yeah, I, can't, I moved yeah. to close the public okay. hearing for this property to the 14th one. Okay, and do I have a second? Okay, how do seconds? Um, so the meeting for 214 Pomeroy Lane for request to demolish a uh, large timber frame barn. Uh, uh, oh, no, wait, we have to vote, sorry. <laughs> So roll call vote, <laughs> uh, Becky Lockwood, uh, to close the public hearing. Yes. Okay. Uh, Madeline Helmer. Yes. Patty Startup. Yes. <clears throat> and I also vote yes. So the public hearing is closed. And now we can move on to any commission discussion. Uh, commissioners have comments for each other before we um, consider a vote to issue a demolition permit. I, I just have the uh, a comment about, you know, when when you hear that it's a poor farm, there are those are particular kinds of structures, in in uh, a generic sense of places that people live to, who were indigent, for example, or um, in rural communities. So I, I I just think when when this gets written up, that it's very clear that we make it 
qualify that it's a standard and poor form, whatever that means, I, that it was from the family of standard and poor. I, I'm trying to Google there stuff were, while we're in deliberation, were, but I- There were two, two families. Okay. And uh, one of them was the poor family and together they formed the company Standard and Poor, which to this day evaluates companies' worthiness to be on the stock market. Right, right. That's, that's, that's the context in which I- Right, and when we, were, we, when we thought it was such a funny thing to name it the poor farm, we didn't realize there were indigent and handicapped people in the mid uh, century that were put in places called poor farms and they right. were working for shelter. So yeah. it's not the best name. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but we might change, I don't know. And no, I mean, it's, not, it's their biggest problem right now. Yeah, Normally, other, other people in town though, do call it the poor farm. You know, I just think because the family, right. you know, from where they can't, you know, it's just, oh, wow, someone from Standard & Poor is in Amherst. And so um, <laughs> it's not right. It's not like the community poor farm. And so right. you know, they actually have, you know, they still might have some remnants of foundation walls or other things. And now that, you know, they're becoming, people recognize, well, we could interpret these sites. And so it's not, it's not that. Right. So, for example, in, in the town of Ashfield, the poor farm is now part of the Bullet Reservation owned by the trustees of reservations. So they're very, very different things. And I, I just think I want to make sure that the, you know, that we're, we get the message out that we're not, we're not demolishing a, 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 a community town owned. Could you farm. say poor family yeah. farm? Yeah, something like that. Yeah, yeah. Other comments? Um, I had a question. What is your, uh, what's the timeline for the demolition of uh, the barn? Uh, ASCP, as long as um, Ryan works with the permitting department. Okay, do you have a, um, just any, like, a, is that within a month? Or I'm asking because um, um, I'm just curious about, um, the commission has been, working for a while on developing kind of a, a preservation plan around barns, not just preserving them, but also documenting ones that are being taken down before they're taken down. And um, I was curious what the timeline was. Um, I spoke with a um, barn assessment um, professional who suggested to me a particular um, type of computer program that, um, can be used to assemble photographs. And unfortunately I was lo looking through my notes today, I couldn't find it, but um, I'd just be interested to know if there was gonna be time enough for us to do any more photographs. I think the ones that you've taken are great, um, but um, that were a possibility. I think Ryan can answer that. I think this is uh, our first and foremost concern is a 10 year old child getting in there. Okay, yep, that makes sense. Yeah, and our intent was to demolish it as soon as possible and be in okay. preparation for permitting and, and building a new barn in the spring. Okay. Uh, that's not to say someone couldn't go in and, and document further. I mean, we could take videos of it or something along those lines. Uh, we don't have a 3D imaging uh, or scanning device per se, but right. which would add significant cost, but it's... Uh, you know, yeah, no, this would be photography some, or something like that would, yeah, would work. Yeah. I think, I mean, I think the photos that you have are great. And um, I'd love to get just a little bit more information. I don't know, uh, this is a question for Nate for later, um, whether it's, whether it would be appropriate to assemble any research that we could just for a potential uh, form B form, but um, we can have that discussion maybe later in the process. Um, do commission members have any other uh, comments or questions? Okay, so um, I am. I I do. Okay. I guess <laughs> I I think this sort of raises our recent um, converse sort of issue that we've been discussing about kind of neglect and demolition by neglect, and I just don't want um, I don't want this to kind of encourage the the process of neglect in order to just justify demolition um, and, 
yeah, I mean, I think it sounds as though it was already derelict and in poor condition when um, the latest owners acquired the property. So that makes it seem more justifiable to me. Um, but I just, it would, it wouldn't sit as well if, if I knew that it was just sort of allowed to, to deteriorate over time so that we could reach this conclusion. Yeah, I agree. I agree, Madeline. It's a slippery slope. Yeah. I agree. It's a slippery slope. However, it's not a slippery slope in, in this particular case. Yeah, I think the condition of it is pretty clear that it, it's it's probably taken a pretty long time for it to get in that condition. And it's also not, uh, it's not unusual and we don't have any sort of um, uh, affirmative maintenance bylaw. So uh, that, that the reality is that these are buildings that are hard to maintain and this one has reached the point, maybe reached the point of of uh, its, its lifespan, so. Yeah, that so I think, yeah, so just quickly, if the commission, you know, were to vote for a demolition permit, we could um, have a condition that we get out there to take more photographs or something. You know, you know, there is a um, Ryan in the in the application. There was a, a floor plan that was submitted, and is that an accurate of the existing bar and the footprint? So it's a kind of a uh, yeah, it's it's accurate um, to the extent that we had a uh, or Sabina had a uh, an engineer out. We did a survey of corners. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. So, you know, I don't know if that's, if we think the commission thinks that's necessary to get any more photographs, like, you know, one from each side, or if we think there's uh, enough digital um, documentation now. But that could, you know, you could, for instance, you could always say issue the demolition permit with the condition that there be, you know, additional photographs or something taken before demolition. It, Yes, Becky. I think that's fine, but I would not want to hold up the demolition um, because it really, to me, looks like that needs to happen for safety. Um, and just that the, the information we've been given is pretty thorough. Um, but if we need to get out there, then we should do it within the next week or so before you start the demolition. Um, I, I don't want you to hold it up for us. Um, Nate, is that something that the commissioners would be expected to do, or would staff and the commissioner go? And yeah, I, I no, agree I, with you. Becky. I can share the images again. I mean, I do feel like we have uh, photographs of the exterior from all sides, um, and then you know interior photographs. So I, you know, typically we'd ask, you know, at least from you know, say the four sides or four corners or however it works. Um, I think we have that. So I, I you know, I, I just suggested that. So as opposed to uh, sometimes we would say, well, we're going to issue a delay to get more documentation. In this right. instance, we wouldn't necessarily issue a delay. We'd actually, you know, allow for the demolition, but with a condition that, you know, before the work is done, we want, we'd like some more photographs. I, I, I just suggested that. I'm not saying that that's the case. I just, you know, I'm, I was just providing that as a, as a possible um, solution. So I, I don't, I don't know if it's necessary either. Yeah, I, um, I would say I don't know that it's necessary either. And I don't know if any of us are in a position to get out there and do it in a professional enough manner to that would be better than what's already been submitted. So right. Um, right. Yeah. Right, Nathaniel, it may be worth showing the floor plan with the photos, um, a key plan with the photos on it. If you wanted to share that, you could see where we've taken photos from. And so maybe that'll give you a better idea of the extent. Yeah, is that is that visible again? The um yeah. Yeah. So yeah, I think the um there was a photo key. There you go. Yeah. Right. And so here's, you know, a nice that's great. Right. So that does indicate every uh yeah. photograph. That's so but I mean, in my opinion, that's more than sufficient. That's really excellent. I agree. Yeah, I agree. All right. Okay, so do commissioners have any more questions or comments? Okay, it's just someone want to forward a motion uh, to issue a demolition permit for the timber frame berm at 214 Pomeroy Lane.
I motion. Uh, do I have a second? Uh, yeah, exactly. A few seconds. Okay, so we'll have a roll call vote. This is a vote to issue a demolition permit for 214 Pomeroy Lane for the demolition of a large timber frame barn. Hetty uh, Startup. Yes. Becky Lockwood. Yes. Madeline Helmer. Yes. And Robin, part of my vote, yes, as well. So the motion has passed. And uh, I'm assuming Nate will be in touch or the town will be in touch with uh, further uh, information. And we really appreciate you coming here and um, sharing this with us. And um, you. hope you have a good evening. Thanks. Thank you. You too. Thank you. Thank you. All right. So next on the agenda are announcements of which um, I have none. Anyone have announcement for the commission? No, uh, hearing none. Um, uh, item two, presentation and discussion of updated plans for the North Common. I will turn over to Nate. I was just gonna just, um... I know the person in attendance was here for 260 Levitt Road, so I don't mind if we um, flip flop okay. an agenda item just to have that okay. that person. So that's uh, item four. So we want to move item four up. Right. Yeah. So item three, just quickly, the North uh, Amherst Fire Station. The staff that had planned to be here is out uh, unexpectedly, so that you know we're, we'd like to move that discussion till. Um, until the next meeting. So they had planned to show images with different colors or material for where the red had been planned. And that, um, you know, obviously isn't available tonight. So. So um, item four, discussion of, uh, with the owner of 200 and 260 Leverett Road about possible changes to their property. So Nate, do you wanna? Bring the owner into the panel discussion. Yeah, Kevin, I, I, um, I thought I yep, invited you to become a panelist. If he's connecting to audio. Yeah. So all Kevin's connecting in the packet, I did submit or you know, include a street view of 260 lever road and then the inventory form for the property and those can be available to share and then i also have you know just the google maps um is up it will be up shortly and so some background on this property is about a 12 acre it was 12 acres and there was a the previous owner had done a lot of landscaping and gardening on this and um Kevin recently purchased it. Um, and so, you know, some of the, if you were, if you drove by or if you looked online, some of the landscaping and some of the, you know, what's happened on the property is, you know, from the previous owner. Because Kevin's not quite connected yet. Well, Kevin's trying to connect twice now. <laughs> Let's see. Oh, we have him now. Maybe he is, yeah. Kevin, can you hear us? We cannot hear you yet. Hmm.
Oops, this, oh, I see. Yeah. Do you have any suggestions, Nate? Um, yeah, I mean, Kevin, I guess you could call in and then have your computer muted. Um, so that sometimes if you call in or, or you're on both, it, there's an echo. Um, sometimes it's, if it's over Wi-Fi, you know, if there's trying to connect over Wi-Fi or something on a computer, it can be slower than just calling it on a phone. But Oh, yeah, the call-in is on the agenda, that number. If he needs the number. And maybe we could I'll try and pull up a map. Yeah, if we would review the images while we're while we're waiting. Yeah, let's see. So happens here. Kevin, are you it looks like you're connected, but oh sometimes. It's like the town's GIS is not working right now either. But... Can you message him the phone number or I can't? Yeah, I could pull that up. Yeah, the phone number is four or three one two six two six six seven nine nine. And then there's a webinar ID you need to enter, which is eight one seven two five two seven two six eight four. And you know, I I, I had I'd emailed. I think it might be in your email too as well if um if that's available. So just as a you know kind of a introduction. So you know, Kevin's I think recently purchased the property and you know, has some ideas about whether or not to modify the house or structures on the property. And so I said, you know, it'd be good to have a conversation with the commission before. Uh, formally applying for any permits or anything. And so this is really just an introductory discussion uh, and, you know, just to, um, right, talk about what, we you know, what could be his ideas for the property. Did everybody get a chance to look at the um, inventory form? Yep. Okay. Pretty interesting. Yeah. I've been working on um, completing Inventory forms. Um, I'm working at the Herringer Valley Planning Commission right now, and it's really making me, uh, allowing me to appreciate buildings like this um, because so many of them have been sided over and lost so much of their historic character. Uh, and isn't it the case that Amos doesn't have very many Greek revival houses of this scale and Right, that's what this inventory form says. Yeah. Can we go on to the next item and come back? And is that a possibility? I think Kevin's joined us by phone. Okay. Just make sure. Um, Kevin, you should be able to speak now. That's, you might have to unmute yourself on your phone. I can do that for you, actually. Can I do that? Hmm. Talking's permitted. Why is that still? I need some sense to move on and get back to Kevin when yeah. we get stuff. Yeah, so I just want to say, Kevin, to unmute the phone, it's star six. You have to hit star six on your phone. How about now? Great. Um, 
I think Nathan, Nathaniel summed it up pretty well. It's an old farmhouse that we bought about five years ago. We've been living overseas and just paying someone to maintain the grass and keep the property up. And what we'd like to do is quite honestly demolish the farmhouse and build a new one. And I was advised to seek your guidance and your advice on what what was in the realm of possible or advisable. Robin, you're muted. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks, Kevin. <laughs> Um, uh, I think if you mute your phone, uh, unless you wanted to add more, um, we can open up discussion uh, with the commission members. Yeah, Kevin, you're on the computer too. I think if you if you turn off your computer, then we can just have you on the phone and then that might work without having an echo. Kevin? I think we lost him on the phone. I think we did as well. Okay. So in terms of agenda items, if we're, um, the, you know, let's see, we don't really have, I mean, some of them are just a little bit more in depth, the one we skipped. I don't, uh, what do we want to start it? And then. Do we want to have a, a small discussion right now about um, just generally what, I know that Kevin Mayer may not be able to hear us, but um, amongst the commission members, thoughts on this particular property. I mean, I know I certainly have some, have some thoughts. Does it seem like a good idea or should we try to convene when we can have him fully participating? Yeah, I mean, nice if Kevin was here for the discussion. Yeah. So maybe we could move, I mean, Kevin, uh, Kevin's. I guess we can move on and wait till he calls back again. Okay. Um, so did we want to go to agenda item two or did we want to maybe go to CPA recommendations since that's a shorter discussion. Kevin, it looks like you're back. Oh, there we go. Okay. If you star six again. This is Kevin, I'm back. Nice. All right, so yeah, I think we're just gonna have a discussion with the commission members and you right now okay. about the property. That's all right. That's great. Okay, um, I'm gonna, I guess I'm gonna just start the discussion by um, reviewing um, if this, uh, if the owner, if the owner would like to demolish this particular building um, for our new demolition delay review process, uh, town and or the town in coordination with the commission would determine whether mm -hmm. it was a significant structure. So that would be the first step, correct? Mm -hmm. Now that we're in our new new phase of, of uh, demolition delay. Um, and then um, again, just reminding the, the commissioners and um, the, uh, well, I won't say applicant, but um, the owner that um, a determination of significance does not mean um, that a demolition delay is automatically put in place. Just uh, mm -hmm. uh, that would be the step that brings it to us um, for review by the, the commission. And it is from the um, inventory form, in my opinion, it is a particularly um, uh, as I was saying before, it's particularly well preserved in terms of its historic character. Um, so that would be my first basic comment. Um, I would want to have a pretty uh, in-depth discussion about um, this property in, in consideration of um, demolition. Did anybody else want to add comments? Becky? Yeah, I would just like to, I guess, 
I feel like we don't know a lot about this and we got it pretty late. Um, but I would sure. like to find out like what, why it's being demolished. Is it in bad shape? Is it just a, a preference to build a different house? So I'm not sure. Um, you know, if it's in really bad shape, like the barn we discussed, it, yeah, that's a different story than, than just, oh, we, you know, wanting to build another house. So I, I feel like we need more information. Okay. No, I, I, I agree. I mean, I, I intend to submit the full application. Um, I'm trying to get your guidance of what would be, when we call it a significant historical structure, what, what is the criteria to designate it as that? Um, and is it the, the, the building itself, the house has been added onto multiple times. It's been renovated and, and, and restored multiple times. Um, so the, there's very little left outside of the exterior front facade that is original. Um, so I'm trying to figure out what, what is the, what, what would make it a significant historical structure, I guess. Um, I think that the, the fact that the exterior looks um, like it's, it's pretty intact um, and, and the exteriors are generally what we um, lean towards when reviewing structures because they're part of the public view. Um, there's a lot of historic character and a lot of historic integrity, at least I'm looking at the um, form B form right now. Um, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So that, that weighs pretty heavily on the side of it being, being historically significant. Um, it, if its interior was intact as well, um, uh, that it, it, that's not as much of a as much of a consideration for the commission, but certainly I think we all as preservationists, um, you know, would lean more heavily in favor of trying to pre preserve something that's particularly well preserved in the interior and the exterior. Um, so our um, if that gives you a little bit of a, a sense that that just because the interior um, doesn't match uh, what it was historically, uh, the exterior. Mm -hmm is pretty heavily weighted. And is it the original farmhouse or the additions that have been added on over time? Is, is that part of the consideration as well? Um, the additions that have been added on over time, um, their context would depend on when they were added. Um, sometimes historic additions can become historically significant. Probably the best example is that um, a lot of houses were transitioned from gable roofs into mansard roofs. And that would be the sort of thing where it was a change to the building. Um, but um, the additions may or may not factor into the significant portion of the building, depending on when they were completed and um, what style they're in. Also, Kevin, look into the. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Sorry. If you look, if I'm looking at the um, second to last photograph of the house. Um, so far, the, the the front of the house and the side elevation with the tree, it doesn't look like there's been any real alteration to the original 1830 house. And what has been added is actually very typical of northern New England mm -hmm. rural um, dwellings like this. And um, the fact that this is uh, documented as um, owned by a minister farmer is really fascinating. Um, so it's your your building is significant, not just for its original front facade facing the public view, as Robin was saying, but it's also significant historically. Um, that's what's contributed to its value over time. Um, in a kind of non-monetary sense. Also, it it seems to have got, you know, much of its land with it. And, you know, I don't, it sounds like there was someone before who was landscaping in on the property quite extensively. So, you know, I would be very interested to know, you know, how you might handle the land as much as the, the building um, in terms of what can be seen from, from um let's see i'm trying to orientate myself here from leverett road um mm -hmm. 
I think I sort of know where the house is. I've driven that road before. It's a, it's an extremely beautiful road that you are on. You are on, you know, Agreed. and so, you know, um, what happens there is, is, is important um, because of how good the house looks from, from the front. Um, and it's obviously been taken care of. I think there was another photograph in the, packet that we were sent that you know shows it's been painted maybe not the same colors as in the original inventory form but you know I think that that's also um you know it tells you something about the stewardship <laughs> of this property over time it's a very old house for Amherst actually it's not the oldest but 1830 is you know it's not original to the town history but it's it's early and this particular style of architecture is not um it's not like there's not millions of examples as there might be in other parts of new england um so i think yeah, that, I'll, I'll leave it at that yeah that's a that's a Kenny makes a good point uh, another another factor that we weigh is you know sort of the relative rarity of something that you know if it was lost it was you know it would be one of um in one of the few examples. Um, just to continue on in the process, um, if if the if you were to apply for a demolition permit and uh, the commission um, the commission's power is the option to impose a 12 month demolition delay. So that's uh, the full extent of our power. Um, it doesn't prevent the devil demolition of the house at the end of that time period. Um, it, what what our intention is is as a commission is to um if we feel that the significance warrants uh, a demolition delay and we issue a demolition delay it's to allow time for an alternative solution for the possible preservation of the house so that just gives you an idea of our of our intent um and and the ultimate process so i don't know if that's if that's uh helpful well it's very helpful no it is it's we looked at one option, which would be to keep the original farmhouse before the additions were made on, added onto it, remove the additions, and then add a new, more modern addition. But to do that would mean, again, gutting the old farmhouse to integrate it with the new addition, and the additional cost would be north of $200,000, and we just can't afford it. Um, right now, the, the there there are problems with the 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 most of it's out of code of course but the stairs are very steep there is no bathroom up where the bedrooms are so i can't have my parents stay here the it, it's very cold it, it's hard to sustain it so we we run the heat almost constantly which bothers me because I'd, I'd like to go much more environmentally sound here um, and it's just very hard with these old buildings to do that okay um Madeline or uh, Becky, do you have any other comments? I, I think you covered it, um, you and Hetty, so far. Right, Kevin, do you have any other questions for us? Um, no, so the additions could be considered part of the historical structure as well. Am I clear there? Oh, All right. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, without without further okay. state, without further information, you know, when the house was inventoried, it, um, you know, it didn't. Uh, it was inventoried in 1988, and it, you know, it, it considered the whole, you know, the structure at the time. It didn't reference that there was a more modern addition that wasn't, you know, integral to the house. So it would take some research to determine when those were built. Um, you know, one thing too, the commission has the ability to ask what's happening in its place, and so I know there is some acreage on the property. You know, it, it, was there ever a consideration of leaving the house and building a new one and not de demolishing it? Or, you know, oftentimes we ask the owners if they could, um, you know, right. We're not concerned as much with the interior as we are with the exterior. Sometimes the assemblage of Understood. buildings, right? The massing of the house with the barn is really important in terms of its view from the street and how, you know, how those buildings were developed at the time and, and used. And so, you know, I've, although you said you've looked at it, I mean, if we were to the commission were to issue a delay we'd want you know we'd ask for your assistance to you know we might have an architect go look at it as well or have someone take a look at the property to say okay could there be 
chances to salvage pieces or how could it be reused? Uh, there is CPA funding available, Community Preservation Act funding, which can be granted to private uh, owners to preserve and restore historic buildings. And, you know, the, it, they're for different reasons. And one could be that the, the view from the street that this property, the barn and the house, just the view shed is important enough that CPA funds could be used to preserve it. And so, you know, when Robin said that there was a delay enacted, then, you know, the commission and staff tries to determine, as she said, alternatives. So uh, is there funding sources available? Are there reasons why the owner, um, you know, wants to take it down? Could there be other reasons to try to save it or incorporate it into a new design or use? And so, you know, that, that's what the delay would be for. And, you know, so the more you could provide at the time of application, the better. So if you're, you know, the commission could say, well, for instance, you know, what if you were putting in another a building, but it modeled that pretty similar in terms of style and massing, you know, that could be, that could help. So the commission can, allow, can ask for that information while deciding whether or not to grant a delay. And so, you know, if they don't have enough information, they, the, you know, the hearings can be continued until they feel like there's enough information to make a decision. No, understood. It was actually helpful listening to you go through the process with the other people applying for permits mm -hmm. to see how a good application should be put together. That was that was helpful, and I will submit the application probably this week, hopefully, with a, a lot of photos. And an architect or, or actually any of the board are more than welcome to come by anytime and take a look at the place. As for the rest of the property, I think it was asked earlier. My intent is to farm. Um, I retired after forty years in the Navy, and um, I want to be a farmer and i'm currently a 60 year old freshman at stockbridge school learning about it. sustainable agriculture that's fantastic so, <laughs> so that is, that is that is my goal is to, to be a farmer and and hopefully we get some credit because when we bought this place it was being split up into six buildable lots Ooh. and we we emptied the bank to buy the whole property because it, it's been a farm and it should stay as a farm um and that's certainly our intent. So while I, I get it, it, it's hard to let go of an old farmhouse that, that is appealing and it, it does look pretty from the street. Um, I, I understand that it, the whole property is being preserved and how it was originally intended to be. Um, the other point I'd make is we, we intend to use the same footprint and, and use a uh, post and beam building um, habitat building that I think will fit the neighborhood pretty well. We've seen a lot of new buildings, new houses on this street, and they all seem to respect the old old look, and we like that as well. All right. Um, thank you for that. Um, one thing, one other possibility that sometimes comes has come up with um, buildings in Amherst is we have had a couple of historic buildings moved. So that's, um, I mean, it, that's a long shot, but that's also a possibility. And um, I just I just wanted to add that uh, as a 55 year old who just got a, a, a degree, I, I commend you on your on your new journey. <laughs> <laughs> well done, well done. No, it's it's been interesting being the uh, the gray hair in the classroom with the kids, yep. but um, yep. <laughs> I, I, I managed to keep up most days. All right. Well, um, if nobody has any other comments or questions, I would just really like to thank you for um, coming and discussing your property with us. And um, oh, I just wanted to mention one more thing, Nate. We still generally do site visits when we have a demolition permit, yep. correct? Yeah we, yes. we, yeah, we have that ability. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So we could cut. We could, the, the commissioners could um, arrange to come out and take a look in person, which I think would be helpful too. Mm -hmm. So thank I think you. it would be great. Yeah, yeah, we, I'm, I'm sure we'd love it. So thank you very much. And um, we will, I guess, be talking to you soon. Thank you, Nathaniel, I'll be in touch, but I'll start working on the uh, application. And sure, yeah. Look forward Thanks. to hearing from y'all. Thanks, Kevin. Okay. Bye. Thank you very much. Thank you, thank Bye. you. Okay, um, so agenda item two will be uh, Nate presenting and discussing on the updated plans for the North Common. Sure. So the, um, yeah, there we are. Oh, sorry, wrong. Uh, I'm just, I'm getting it pulled up. Um, so for the commission members, there's some new ones, but I, you know, I don't want to say how long, but it's been many years that the town's been working on 
um, you know, it's called the North Common, but really it's the town common outside town hall. So between Main Street and Spring Street, uh, we've received funding a few, actually, I guess it's probably been a year ago. Um, and we've applied for CPA funding for in the last, you know, five or six years to build up a budget to renovate that area. So the, you know, parking lot outside of Main Street down to the Spring Street parking lot. And um, the commission had looked at uh, plans I guess it was probably a year ago, Robin. I, I know I had looked at some, and the concept hasn't changed much. We, what what, we're, what I'll show you in a second is you know probably like ninety five percent complete plans, and so you know the overall concept was eliminate the parking lot outside town hall, put a plaza in, and then um, you know most of it's just landscaping, walkways, and seating. So there's really no vertical elements. There's no structures being proposed, and it's just taken a while to. Um, get plans to a point where we feel like they can be shown again, where we know, you know, the grading better and some materials. And so what's, if this, I was going to zoom in one more time, maybe it's a really large plan. So it takes a minute to reload. So quickly, this is, um, North is up, so here's Main Street, here's Town Hall in the white. And the idea is to, you know, from the edge of the building, rework the sidewalk, um, you know, have another, another a new crosswalk across Main Street, and then have Bolt would be one way south, and have this be a plaza area for, um, you know, cars can drive on it, but then when uh, there's events to have, you know, a gathering space, have a, where the parking lot is now to have this lawn area with some terraced um, seating that are about you know a foot tall and then have a more lawn area up here, have wide sidewalks along the front. Um, I will say that between you know one side here, South Pleasant Street to Town Hall, there's it's like five or six feet of grade change. And from Main Street to Spring Street, there's 10 to 12 feet of grade change. And so what what the plan really is is to only is to cut down two trees, existing trees. So there was one, the um, Norway maple, the Mary maple, and one other um, tree. But um, most of the existing trees will remain, and so we're really not trying to do much grading where there's already green space. And so, you know, we've incorporated diagonal walkways uh, that are accessible, and so. Um, you know, there's no steps within these walkways. They're wheelchair accessible. They're fully ADA. Um, it does present some challenges uh, with grading and, um, you know, the desire lines we're trying to match as best we can. Um, you know, one of the goals was to try to activate this space. And so, you know, right now when during COVID, we put picnic tables out, the town did in this space, they're, they're used a lot. And so we realized that this can be, you know, a really active space. And so, what you're seeing here, and I guess it's brown, are benches. We have a central plaza that could have up to 30 tables and chairs. We have the WCTU fountain that will now have a little plaza area and seating. Uh, we have some crescent shapes off the walkways. Um, you know, we have more seating around the perimeter, a bike share station. Um, and then, you know, we're using rain gardens underneath some of the tree areas uh, and seating areas to try to help direct traffic and just to, um, you know, help infiltrate water. So th there is an engineering solution right now. There is a lot of runoff. Um, you know, a lot of the green space, adding more green space will help, but there will be, you know, some catch basins and some, some ability to try to um, prevent any, any existing runoff. And, you know, the space hasn't, we're not necessarily programming it. You know, like I said, there could be events. We're hoping that you know, the lighting of the Mary Maple will continue that, you know, if we're having flag raising events that we can gather here or here, there's the flagpole here, there's another flagpole here. So we're maintaining two flagpoles. Um, you know, we'd let, you know, if, if an extension of the farmer's market or some event wants to use the plaza or the sidewalks or the green space, you know, that, that could happen. And so we're really thinking about opportunities here to use this and activate the space. We are, um, you know, and we'll have, interpretive signs, the hope is for the fountain and maybe one or two explaining um, as part of the grant funding, um, you know, heat island effect and the use of um, increasing urban tree canopy and what that does to the space, the, you know, the microclimate here. 
Um, um Nate, are the circles, are those trees? These circles here? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah, so these are all existing. Okay. Um, so we removed the Merry Maple is here where the seating plaza is. And there's maybe one other tree. Um, I don't know, I forget if there's an Rory Maple here or here that would be removed. But otherwise, these are these are just showing existing. Okay. Um, the ones that are, you know, say up here that are smaller and different color, those are new. I think we're going to try to plant one, you know, maybe one or two more shade trees. Um, but yeah, most of these we're trying to maintain the existing. Okay. And so this is, you know, this I think is probably easier to read than the actual plan. I can scroll down a little bit. We're adding a sidewalk to this east side. Uh, so with Boltwood being one way, we're, there's proposed to be parallel parking here and then sidewalks on both sides. Um, just, you know, so someone can get out of the power and not walk on the grass. We're not changing this sidewalk on Spring Street. And now we have, a, you know, the walkway comes in here with another seating area. Uh, the sidewalk ends, you know, there's already this diagonal pathway um, which we're, you know, maintaining maybe in a little different location. And, uh, an op, uh, you know, one um, option is to have, which may happen at the time of construction or after having some stepping stones here, if there's a desire line to cut this, this um, you know, this path here. So there is a curb here, and this is a pretty steep grade change to make this level with this walkway. And then, you know, there's a, you know, a few feet of drop off here with um, ground cover. So we know people may want to just cut the corner and not walk up or around. So we have, you know, the idea that we could have some stones there, but we don't want a formal walkway. It's within the root zone of the tree. I think, you know, I think that's it for now. Um, I can go to the other plan um, just to show quickly, you know, more detail, you know, what, you know, where it is now. Um, you know, that's the the rendering was taking this and actually making it a little bit more legible. But we have, you know, we have worked it out in terms of grading, um, accessibility. And so for the materials, we're doing a lot of granite walls and curbing uh, that you would see. You know, these are granite walls, sitting, sitting granite blocks sometimes for sitting, um, you know, concrete sidewalks on the exterior, asphalt maybe in the interior, and then where these plazas are. Um, could be um, stamped um, material, it could be, um, or, you know, stamped concrete, um, you know, a different variety of plantings. And then the plaza here would be, what is the new material for crosswalks on Mass Ave? And so it's a, um, it's a tactile surface that's, it's, I don't want to say it's embedded in, but it's laminated on top of um, concrete or asphalt. And so it, uh, it's both for vehicles and for pedestrians. So there's, you know, we're trying to simplify material palettes and most of this will be on the ground plane anyway. So it's not highly visible, but what will be visible will be, you know, granite walls and seating walls. Um, and, you know, there's granite six inch, four inch granite curbing along parts of the walkway. And so what specific feedback are you looking for from the commission? Um, so this is basically a return of the space to its historical use, right? Before it was turned into a parking lot, it was mm -hmm. a common, is that correct? Right, I mean, it's been, right, or it's, you know, in the 20th century, it, you know, the parking lot has changed over time, um, but it's a pretty big step to say we're removing the parking up here. And so, you know, I think the feedback was just if there was any any particular comments about, you know, materials or, um, you know, you know, the fountain is being moved with, you know, having some seating around it. Um, you know, I think when we brought this originally, we hadn't had this level of detail. And so we're bringing it back to the Disability Access Advisory Committee saw it yesterday. Uh, the Design Review Board will uh, see it again. And so it's just a, you know, really an update. Um, and if there's any any other comments or questions, you know the the goal is to try to get this um, ready for bidding. You know the next you know this winter, so construction can start in the spring or summer. Do commissioners have any comments? Well, I'm I'm very excited about this. Um, 
plan and this project. Um, yeah, I, th I think it's it's kind of fun how the, the curve of the plaza area sort of mimics the curve of the town hall um, mm. at the corner there. And just, I'm just trying to think about how views of town hall will incorporate this, um, the new design. Yeah, no, it's uh, interesting you mentioned that we, um, in the renderings we had consultants, you know, a few years ago, they, you know, had, um, you know, showed an image looking this way with Town Hall. And so, um, you know, and some of the designs that two flagpoles were right here, and the decision was to move them. So they're actually not blocking Town Hall. So if someone, this is actually, also this corner is one of the you know one of the highest points in town and really visible so we're trying to keep this corner open just so this area this this lawn and plaza area and there's still a view to town hall from from the streets and so it does become a well you know welcoming view if you're coming into the town i think my other question was just who will be maintaining the these um uh the sort of flower beds and the sort of Northwest corner, it's pretty yeah, extensive. A, yeah, um, <laughs> you know, we've, uh, you know, with the, yeah, it's a really good question. I think the town obviously will, and, and it may be that, um, you know, if there's a friends group or, you know, there's anyone else, the bid might, you know, um, offer some assistance or we might ask them to. So, you know, right now it's, it's you know, it would be public works. And so with, addition of the Kendrick Park playground and then you know we've we've renovated Groff Park too in a few years um, ago we've realized that the right upkeep and maintenance is as important as the you know a new design and construction and so I think that's become people are more aware of that so in terms of budgeting and future capital funding or you know ongoing funding I think that's becoming more you know a little bit at least a little more on the oh you know there's more awareness there so mm -hmm. I don't, I don't have the exact exact answer, but I know that, right, I think the maintenance is a big one. And so- um, I, It's just so prominent, yeah. Mm -hmm. I, you, you know, the commission could volunteer. No. <laughs> I know. <laughs> you know, the town does a great job, you know, before COVID, UMass had the service day in the fall. And so we would often use, the public works would often use, you know, 20 to 30 or, or more members of UMass to help say clean up West Cemetery or, or a cemetery or a park. And so that's something that, I'd love um, to happen again and have this become, you know, could you know, maybe there's an annual cleanup with the community. That's not the same as weekly maintenance, but, you know, at least we can, you know, it'd be great to have, um, you know, a few different sources of, of help. Yeah, I think activating the space is just great for the whole downtown. I mean, for the, just the health of these, of the historic buildings surrounding it as well. And just, maintaining a thriving economy. Mm -hmm. so, um, Becky, did you have your hand up? Uh, yeah, um, I, I just wanted to say, I, I love that, well, I'm, I'm excited about it too, but I, I, I love the design of it. I love the um, things that are being put there that will preserve things ecologically. But, but what I really like is just the whole concept of removing that ugly old parking lot and giving the town back the common part of the common, which originally, way back in the day, it was something that everybody shared for their cows and, and you know, whatever else. So we're getting it back again. And um, Nain, is that the historical view behind you? <laughs> You're back. Yes, that is, yeah. that is yeah. a view. Someone asked me what, what year that's from, and I, I, I haven't looked it up to know, but. Okay, all right, yeah. Yeah, the, um, yeah, that, uh, yeah, the removing the parking is really interesting. We had a parking consultant a few years ago, and they said, you know, you always want parking central. Um, you know, it's visible. Um, but then they even said, well, wow, you know, when you come into downtown Amherst in front of your historic town hall, there's an ugly parking lot. I'm not sure that's the best location for it. And it was interesting that a you know a parking consultant said that. Right. right. And so they say not only is it parking, you know, you want it visible, but you sometimes you also don't want it to detract from what people are coming to see or, you know, what the attractions are. So, um, yeah, it was a pretty big decision, though, to, to, to remove it. Okay. Any other comments? 
Okay, thanks, Nate. Yeah, so I think just quickly, the process will be, you know, we have to send this to the state for the grant program. They want to just have um, review the final plans and then Mass Historic, this is a landscape in a National Register District. And so they they looked at the preliminary design. They didn't have any comments that this would, you know, they thought it was nice too, but we'll send them these plans as well. You know, I think sometimes they're concerned that someone will put in a structure or you know, cha really change the, the landscape or space. And so when we applied for the grant, we submitted a product notification form and they didn't have any any issues at that time. So I'm not envisioning they would now either. But. Okay, thank you. Okay, um, agenda item five is a, a review of CPA recommendations. Take it away, Nate. <laughs> yeah, so I don't, yeah, I don't, I don't have anything pulled up. You know, the CPA committee has, um, you know, they're trying to fund everything, right? So they're, they're trying yeah. to figure out a way to support all the projects, not at the, not at, you know, the full budget. Um, yeah, I can, I think I can give a quick recap. Um, the South Church uh, was, was uh, recommended at the full amount. So this, and just to remind everybody, the CPA committee, reviews all the applications um, and uh, votes on a recommended slate. So they can vote projects down um, and they can send them on and then, but, the, but they're, the slate is just a recommendation. It's a recommendation that goes before, I think review before the finance committee and then has to be approved by town council. So CPA, does its part in moving projects forward. Anything that the CPA decides not to um, not to approve, the town council cannot uh, act against that. Um, so the slate goes forward. So the big projects were, um, let's see, the South Church was recommended for the full amount. The, uh, the Mabel Loomis Todd painting conservation was recommended at the full amount. The barn and outbuilding preservation program was recommended at a, a lower amount of ten thousand dollars, which um, I felt like was a pretty good um, start for what pretty much a pilot project. Um, the uh, the Wildwood Cemetery project, uh, I believe, the applicant reduced their ask to I think it was ninety seven thousand, and that was recommended. Um, and the North Church was, uh, we had a discussion about that, that, that um, followed over into the CPA committee and um, it was tabled for further feedback from the applicant and the town will hopefully be working with the applicant to help get a, a better, um, better project layout for uh, the funds needed to address the most immediate issues. And, and preservation restrictions were taken off the slate and then funds were moved into each of the recommended historic preservation projects to cover the cost of a preservation restriction. So that was that was something new. So each project I think got an additional $5,000 um, to be used for the legal fees that are required for the um, preservation restriction. Yeah, which is really nice. So I think, you know, it's a, you know, I'll call it a soft cost of projects, but you know, usually you want documentation of the building, historic narrative, sometimes elevational drawings, and you know, in the past, there's no fund. The funding isn't requested for that, so usually it comes on uh, either the town's um, expense or the applicant somehow needs to figure out how to do that. So it's it's nice to fold that into a project at the beginning. I do think you know, Robin and I talked the other day the the North Church or the Korean. Um, I think, is it Korean Zion? Yes. And, yeah, yeah, Church in North Amherst. They, the CPA committee has put money in reserve with the hope that in the next month or two, there's a better estimate for what needs to happen to that structure. And so staff is hoping to reach out to them and get something. Um, we've had some internal conversations about trying to, you know, do that in the next few weeks. Um, I know we've had, um, you know, it's interesting because the CPA committee is somewhat reluctant to uh, provide due diligence funding for a project, say, for instance, to hire an architect or engineer without knowing that the 
there's actual preservation work happening. But in this case, we really do need to know, you know, what's the priority for that structure. And I know the commission had mentioned that. So the CPA committee, um, you know, is still trying to keep some money available for that if, if, if it can be worked out. Yeah, and, and I think what we ended up doing was um, uh, folding back, um, basically the amount for their roof ask was, I think around $154,000. And that's the money that we put in reserve. So there's still CPA funds that can cover a repair. And we're hoping, um, hoping that it would be less than that. That's kind of the idea to both get uh, more estimates for um, the work that actually needs to be done and get a, um, a better perspective of, of additional, additional work that might need to come before the CPA in the future. So the funds were retained um, to make sure that that project wouldn't be left out and the committee can be reconvened uh, to review the project again um, before, I don't know, before what, like the beginning of June, I guess. So. Mm -hmm. So that is, does anybody have any questions about the CPA recommendations or comments? Okay. Um, so agenda item number six is a discussion of policy for historic preservation restrictions. Um, so we yes. had talked about this as, a, yeah, we talked about this as a committee before, a commission before, um, how, what kind of a policy do we want in terms of um, the size of the project, the length of the preservation, the, um, the work for staff to um, cover the restrictions and the funding for it. So that's kind of what this uh, agenda item is about. Yeah, and I think we can, you know, have a more in-depth conversation in the next few months. You know, Ben had researched this a little bit. So the CPA language, um, says that you know you can you are required to get a CPA a restriction a historic preservation restriction when CPA funds are used to acquire an interest in property and so typically that has been interpreted to mean when you actually purchase a property for historic preservation not when you rehabilitate it and so in the past we've said that no matter the amount of funding or type of project even a twenty thousand dollar preservation project requires a permanent preservation restriction and a permanent restriction needs to be approved by the Massachusetts Historical Commission and follow their guidelines and standards. And that is a timely and costly endeavor sometimes. And so, you know, Northampton, for instance, they often don't require a preservation restriction, you know, if it's a certain dollar amount or a certain kind of project. Um, you know, the town attorneys recommended, you know, a dollar threshold or some other kind of thresholds, you know, below which could be a 30 year or a 15 year, above which could be a permanent restriction. And you know, I think it's something that's worthwhile to consider because the, the CPA committee um, a, has asked a little bit, um, and I think it would be great to have the commission kind of be on the forefront of that discussion and then you know, recommend something to the CPA committee in town. You know, for instance, um, when properties acquired with um, CPA funding for open space, it's really easy to put a conservation restriction on it. You know, we, the town's purchased it outright. There's nonprofits that hold these restrictions like the Kestrel Land Trust. And that system has been established long enough that it, it works easily. In terms of historic preservation restrictions, you know, we don't necessarily have an agency that monitors them. You know, there isn't, the historical society isn't an agency that monitors them. We don't have a, you know, antiquity society or something that's too local. And so it's always been a, uh, you know, an issue with historic preservation about, you know, even, even if there is a restriction, is it, if it's in perpetuity, we need to have um, Massachusetts Historical Commission approve it, and then it gets filed, and it's a, an encumbrance on the property, and there's not a lot of monitoring or maintenance of it, and so, you know, I think it's a, a something the commission can talk about, you know, for instance, I think a 30-year restriction is one where some of these institutions or properties that are requesting funding, um, you know, probably within 30 years, they would probably ask for CPA funding again. And so then another 30 years is just rolled onto it. And so in essence, it becomes a permanent restriction because you know, it, if they, you know, on year 25 or year 20, they want CPA money for a preservation project, essentially we could keep rolling out, you know, extending the deadline of the restriction in a sense so that there is something in place. Um, um, anyway, yeah. 
and, and my question was um, around around the concept of um, of monitoring. Um, so the purpose of having a preservation restriction is to assure that um, that both their eyes on the property and also that the owners are sort of instructed in how to be good stewards for their building. So there might be changes that someone would undertake. I gave the example of a of a monitored or a, a restricted property, um, not knowing that they couldn't replace their windows, which is a pretty common um, upgrade. And a lot of a lot of people don't realize um, the importance of uh, historic windows to the integrity of a building. So um, when I was doing my graduate work up in Vermont, the preservation restrictions that they have up there are usually, that a lot of them are held by the um, Preservation Trust of Vermont and they have a yearly monitoring program where they go and they check on the property and they make sure that, um, you know, that, that they coordinate with the owners and make sure that they understand what needs to, to be done or not be done um, over the course of time. So I would want to make sure that we had some sort of monitoring in place because I just don't see the point of a preservation restriction that has nobody checking on it. And it really should be done on a yearly basis. And and I like I said before, I mean, I like to sell it more as um, engagement with the owners as opposed to like, um, you know, monitoring, monitoring sounds a little, um, or enforcement sounds a, a little bit more negative, but to just engage with property owners on how to maintain the building and what sort of changes are permissible or, or not, and who to contact if they have questions. And so for the commission, I know previously, I think, you know, even a $500,000, I think there was a $500,000 kind of threshold maybe over which could have been permanent under which maybe was a staggered term. And so those are things that we'd like to discuss and then present to the town. Um, you know, it's interesting, for instance, with the South, um, South Church, we're preserving a steeple for a fair amount of money, um, and it, but it's a small piece of the, you know, the architecture of the building, but it is you know, important for the character of the, of the structure. And so, you know, some people might say that needs to be a permanent restriction, some might not. And so I think we have some past projects we could use as, you know, as examples of, you know, would that, would we want that to be permanent or say 30 years or something? And then that could help guide the policy as well. So should we, um, should we develop some sort of, you know, proposed, do you want the commission to develop a proposed structure? Do you want to propose something to us? Like with examples like that, that we could kind of give a give us a framework for future discussion. Yeah, I, I think I know Ben and I had started something, and I can try to um, resurrect that, and then you know provide some more information for the next meeting. Okay. And I think it would be good timing. So you know the CPA recommendations that are moving forward now would be voted on in the spring, and then funding available in July. So we could have something in place for those for the newer. Um, proposals and, okay. and if not at least for moving forward or you know i don't know we could add, we could say it's applied retroactively as well but it'd be nice to have some some guidance okay does anyone else have any comments or questions no okay um next up is old business national register nominations Yeah, I, I put that on there. I, I just, you know, sometimes you have old business on an agenda and it we can it be it can be a quick update. I was gonna add one other thing there, just so we don't forget about it. I I um you know I talked to Shannon. Um it seems like Mass Historic or National Park Service really does want um <laughs> unfortunately uh new forms um you know in the process of getting these districts in Amherst expanded or new district nominated, it's just taken a while. So we do have $25,000 available of CPA funding, which I think could be used for this. And so I think maybe I'd want, you know, it could happen if not tonight, to, you know, at the next meeting, we could say, you know, we could actually have it be an agenda item and the commission could vote the use of those funds for those nominations. I think it was kind of agreed to last meeting, but just to formally to do that. And then we can, um, you know, try to get PVPC under contract. The um, you know, I don't. I think Mass Historic really won't move it forward uh, without without that. Um, so, 
so this summer, I uh, I did a project this summer working for the Berkshire Regional Planning Commission on um, uh, all of their historic commissions and understanding um, the role of historic commissions. It was very enlightening for me. And so I just want to give like a quick overview of how I think I came to understand um, a town's inventory and national register nominations. And then um, I can ask you, Nate, um, what we're specifically thinking about bumping up to the national register level. But um, in my analysis in Berkshire County, um, one of the questions that my boss had me answer was, what was the status of the town's inventory? So was it up to date? Uh, was was it um, insufficient? And we didn't really have a good metric for it. And over the course of the few weeks, I figured out a way to kind of categorize things. And basically um, what happened in terms of getting things into an inventory, that's our form B form. So those are, those are things that are not on the National Register. They're just background information and then they have to meet certain guidelines. There was a big push of them. And in, and in my report, I used um, charts for each of the towns so that you could see how many forms were filed when. And what you basically see is this curve of like 1970 to 1980, and then down to like 2000. And then depending on the town, you might have a curve up again in the early 2000s or the 2010s, but um, a, a, an inventory that was insufficient and out of date. And then there are two things. So if you don't have enough properties and if your forms are out of date. So the form that we saw today for the um, Leverett Road property, that would be considered an out of date form. The forms that are submitted today have much more um, much more architectural detail uh, and, and architectural narrative and much more historical narrative. So what I don't know is what the status of Amherst's inventory is. And then I also don't know um, what, uh, once you've got a good, my, my understanding from this project was that Mass Historic won't consider working on a National Register nomination for you until your inventory is up to date. <laughs> so that means, cleaning up all or, or a good section of um, items that need to move from a 1988 sheet to a 2023 sheet, um, and then um, deciding which properties uh, move to the national register level. So do you, do you know the status of our inventory uh, in that regard and what this, this money would be, um, we'd be giving to PVP or we'd be contracting with PVPC to do work on the inventory or is it just for national register nominations? I think it's both. And so, you know, so Amherst has, you're right, in the late eighties and then the nineties, there's like 800 properties were inventoried and those forms are, um, you know, as we would say out of date. And then there's been subsequent um, uh, inventory um, forms completed. But so what we've, you know, the three projects or three areas were an expansion of the East Village, a new depot district and or an expansion of the Dickinson district. And those were filed with Mass Historic. They you know, had site visits. Essentially, they were completed on our end. They were then forwarded to the National Park Service. And I think the National Park Service has said, well, my understanding is just that the, within those districts themselves, the inventory forms are out of date. And so they would like, you know, just say those specific properties. What, and, but, you know, that could be 120, 150 properties need to have new inventory forms. And then, um, and then possibly new nomination forms developed. And so that's where, that's to me, that's where the money would go, not to update the townwide inventory forms to take, say, something on Southeast Street, but really to focus on those three nominations that, you know, are, have been in process and are really close to being completed. And so, um, but I think it will take a little more research say on PVPC's part to complete the new inventory forms. And so, you know, when we had um, a few years ago, we had, we inventoried about hundred outbuildings and Mass Historic did this. So many of the properties had been inventoried the main structure, but not the outbuildings. And when we actually had a grant through Mass Historic to do it. And when we submitted the inventory forms, they said, well, even the original inventory forms on the main house have to be converted to the new forms. Right. And so, you know, new photographs taken, new descriptions written, and um, luckily they didn't make us do new research on the properties, but it sounds like for the nominations, it might need to have a little bit more research done on property. So 
And so these nominations are all district nominations? They are. Not individual. Not individual. And it's the East Village and the Dickinson expansion. And the depot district. So yeah. around the, the, the um, train station. Got it. Okay. So that's three. So I, I remember that um, before Ben left, um, Nate, he told me that we don't have a form B for the fire station, central fire station. And if I had more time, I would offer to do one, but I know we we need one for that building. Yeah, and I think my understanding is the challenge is that um, to get a, well, the form, I don't quite understand the form B process that well. Um, I mean, I think there is work that commissioners can do because I, for my summer job, I, we met with the commission in Clarksburg who um, they didn't have any money to hire a consultant to do uh, a planning, um, a, a, any updates of inventory firms, but they were doing research on their own. And we sort of encouraged them to, you know, it's fine to develop a file of information. You don't have to prepare the um, form B, but if you want to compile resources and bibliographies um, to help when ever funding goes through for a particular um, property, that's a possibility too. I don't know what the Mass Historic Commission would do if, you know, somebody with enough training who can write a good uh, inventory B form just wanted to do one as a volunteer and submit it if it was up to their professional standards. I have no idea how they would feel about that. I just know how they feel about it when you're doing big grants that involve their money. <laughs> yeah, no, I, I agree. I think that, Hedy, you could, if you wanted to, start a file. Mm -hmm. You can download the form B from Mass Historic's website and you know, off, when we were, um, for instance, doing local historic district study committees where we're looking at different properties, the volunteer study committee completed many of the inventory forms. And so we worked with special I'm happy to have, Sorry, Nate, I'm, I'm happy to have a go at the central fire station. Yeah, and so some of it is, you know, special collections. We've worked Just with see what it's like. resources. Do you want to share it with me too, Hedy? I can. Yeah, yeah, that would be good. I'd love to have a partner in crime, Madeline. That yeah, good. and um. I mean, I have been, I've, now that I'm working there, I am, I'm like right now I'm working on um, historic narratives for Monson and I've done architectural descriptions too. So I'm getting a much better sense of what is required. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I can help um, in that Great. regard as well. Great. Um, yeah, that the only other, my only other thought about our inventory is, um, if and when we're going to start um, like moving into the next phases of history, particularly mid-century modern. Petty and I have talked about doing inventory forms for, you know, these um, more modern buildings that are just kind of scattered around town and, um, you know, just kind of fun in general. <laughs> but um, to think about that as kind of the next, the next push too, to sort of, you know, the, the newer Amherst. Um, start getting well, that documented it's, it's you know we're we're 223rd year of the 21st century so in two years we'll have been a quarter of our century and and that's kind of staggering yeah <laughs> i just read today that tintin tintin the famous cartoon character he's 94 years old this year <laughs> Yep. I and mean, that just gives you some perspective on right. what is really historic these days. <laughs> right, right. So our 1950s, um, you know, mm, ranch, they're, ranch, they're, houses, ranch houses are yeah, coming ancient. into their own. Yeah, right. <laughs> but they're coming into their own in terms of, yeah. you know, they need to be recognized in terms of the inventory, so. I just had one question about the, uh, the amount of money. Um, you said there's about 25,000 we could use to start with the new employees. How much can you get done with that amount? Do you have any sense? Like, I don't know what it costs. Yeah, I don't, I'm not sure anymore either. Um, you know, I, I'm, I'm hoping that we wouldn't need all of it to forward the nominations and there would still be some left over, but you know, we'd have to, you know, have a cost estimate from PVPC and just see where that goes. You know, at one point we could say, oh, I know if you, you know, this is now, gosh, like four or five years ago, six years ago, we could say, oh, it's a, 
you know, a few hundred dollars a form, right? But I don't know what it right. is now, um, especially if Mass Historic is asking for a little bit more research and narrative on each property. Yeah, the standard is really um, quite different from the form we saw today. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think the, yeah, in 88, I don't know if it was just to try to get as many done as possible, but sometimes there's just not, you know, a lot of it's incomplete. Uh, so it's nice to have a starting point, but there really wasn't a lot written or researched about, about the property. Yeah, and I mean, what I'm able to do sitting in front of a computer, um, you know, in eight, in seven and a half hours a day, I mean, it's astonishing how quickly you can, you know, you could go through a, um, a, deed, uh, a title chain back to the original owners. You've got historic maps that you can pull up. You've got genealogy bank, you've got obituaries, you've got newspapers.com. I mean, it's incredible. We don't need, we almost don't need to leave our desks for anything. So in the one sense, it's, you know, I'm not sure that, um, well, I mean, I'll just say that the a lot of, a lot of prices haven't um, kept pace with the wages or vice versa. <laughs> so, um, and I think in, you know, I think in the seventies the and the eighties, there was just a tremendous um, concern to begin to build the inventory to build up the National Register. And um, now it's uh, it's just, um, it's gotta be much more in depth. So, um, but the capacity is there, which is just pretty cool. Okay, does and anybody have- Are oh, all of eight, are all those 800 or so forms for Amherst, those are on MACRIS through MHC, is that right? Yeah, so Macris has a database okay. where the Macris maps now, which is a nice way to 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 enter the that you know to view that information. So they they are so they you know there's a few that are missing uh, I've noticed, um, or they had a they had an older PDF but somehow it's not attached to the maps, but they you know they did have them all they have them all electronically and the district nominations and some area forms, and so it's it's all there. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I was looking for one for the grist mill today mm -hmm. on Macris Maps, and I didn't see it. And it seemed like that was, I'll have to look in Macris because um, it's good to know that because I thought, I thought I'd seen one before. And I was surprised that it wasn't there. Yeah, so yeah, yeah. So I found that like, you know, on Baker Street, there had been, I don't know if it was just a, a for instance, there was a labeling problem or they, when they completed the inventory forms, they just, I am loosely show, you know, they show the location by drawing little blocks on a map. And then when Mass Historic transfer them to the map, they assign them to the wrong property. And so, you know, with the grist mill, I don't know, maybe it's just if you did a street search and went through the database and not the map, you might be able to find it. But yeah, I think you're probably right. Yeah. Any other comments? Okay, uh, 7B is barn chores. Um, I don't. Uh, I don't know where we were with this. Um, I know that I had um, suggested I worked with a um, a barn expert up in New Hampshire uh, this fall, and he does um, talks around the region. And I asked him if he would ever come as far as Amherst, and he said yes, with good weather and and mileage reimbursement. <laughs> He's a really wonderful guy named John Porter. <laughs> And so um, I thought it might be a great idea to have him invite him to come to give a talk. We could possibly coordinate with the, um, uh, what is it? The Western Massachusetts uh, Historical Commission Coalition um, if they wanted to support something uh, like that. Um, but as far as getting barn tours going, I'm not sure um, what other folks had in mind. Isn't there a Pioneer Valley network for American history or museums, local history. I think I'll check Robin and I'll let you know. Okay. That way they might co-sponsor in some way. Yeah, I mean, I don't, you know, I don't, you know, I probably, I, we probably all have some ideas. I mean, I was just thinking when, if, you know, come nicer weather, you know, if we could find a few property owners who are willing to have a tour, it could just, you know, it could be a slow start. But, you know, like we said, when we had PVPC meet property owners through outbuilding inventories, it's amazing you know, sometimes how much information the family has and they're really willing to share it. And so, you know, it may not be public, they may have old photographs and some of it is just to gain an appreciation for, you know, the outbuildings and barns in town. And so 
um, yeah, I mean, I, I'm hoping it becomes, you know, an education piece, and then maybe a preservation piece, but I don't, I don't have an idea at all really <laughs> right now how to get it started or how to program it. But. Okay. Um, I'm going to just throw out there that we could make a goal for this, um, maybe the early part of the fall, if, um, if we keep it as an agenda item and just go from meeting to meeting to aim to have something developed for September. I mean, I, I'd be excited to, to try to get that going. I'd love to get the, the assessment program, barn tours, and a barn speaker in one year, maybe get a little press would be a really great, um, great opportunity for us to, to, like you said, have outreach and, and finally, finally cross those off the list. <laughs> Did you say September? Yeah. What did yeah. you think about that? That would be, and maybe even really incorporate good. a tobacco barn. And I mean, that's the season, isn't it? Um, yeah. Oh, that's that what would that be really, yeah. really, yeah. So you'd Great want to do the tour and the speaker at the same time in the same month, Robin, or at this, you, would it be all one day, you know, like a speaker in the morning and then we'd go off and look at stuff or that's what they used to do in New Hampshire with the preservation um, alliance barn tours was. That's a good, that's a good idea. We'd meet, yeah. We would meet somewhere centrally located, preferably in a barn, preferably <laughs> stored, and then we would go off and look at barns and then that would be it. Okay. Yeah. Well, John, I, I saw John's presentation at, um, you know, at a little, I don't know if it was a church or a meeting house, um, you know, he has a slideshow and everything. Um, mm, great. But yeah. Great. Okay. All right. Well, we'll carry that forward till next time and see what we, see what we come up with between then and now. Great. Any other comments on barns, barn tours? Okay. Sorry about that. Next item on the agenda is public comment. Do we have anyone in the audience? No one uh, in attendance right now. Oh, no one in attendance. Okay. All right. Any unanticipated items? Well, one thing I was going to just mention. Um, you know, we are still going through the update process of the preservation plan and PVPC is hoping to get all the surveys live, you know, this month. And, um, you know, so then we can figure out, we might do some mailings, but we'll at least have it online. We can link to it from the website. They'll have it up. And so we'll start that process to get the in, um, public input as part of the preservation plan update. Can uh, I follow the town manager on Twitter? Can he promote that or somehow can it come up from the town or the bid or yeah um can you send me an email just saying that and then i sure. can um, yeah well, usually we'd have it you know we can put it on twitter but it's interesting you know if the town's twitter account might not really be as followed as an individual so right okay. it'd be nice to i can I, I, then i'll just i can at least ask the public outreach officers to be able to do that okay and yeah and any other social media i mean that's the social media that i use but um, I just want to, I made a note, um, to ask the question of whether, uh, the commission would be, uh, interested in and what the town's plans are for meeting in person. Um, I can say, I personally think I would enjoy some in-person meetings. I appreciate the convenience of Zoom, um, but, um, I find the discussion challenging, and I'm just curious if um, we've, if we as a culture have shifted permanently to Zoom, or um, if we're going to go back and forth, or if we're going to go back to in-person meeting. It would be, it'd be nice to go back and forth. Sorry, Becky. <laughs> uh, no, it's okay. I was just wondering. I've attended some seminars and things that are hybrid. Is it possible to do that? So if someone, you know. Sometimes you, you get an illness and you can't appear in public that you can lay in on Zoom. Yeah, I think that's a technological question that is up to the town. Yeah. Yeah. I, mean, I, th I think, honestly, I think hybrids really is a really um, difficult and not really good way to go. No. Uh, because okay. we have to then have someone in the town room and we're basically 
acting as a hybrid meeting for people who call in, but then some people have to be in person and other people can be at home. I, I've, you know, I think it's a really difficult thing to manage. So, you know, we don't know yet what the state will do. Um, honestly, I, I like Zoom. To me, it's a really good work-life balance. If we're back in person a lot, it, you know, it's not, it's not as great for me. Um, I think we still could meet in person, say every three months, like every third meeting or something could be in person. But I, I find the Zoom meetings to be really easy to share information and to, you know, to allow the public to attend. And so, you know, the yeah. interesting thing is if, I don't know how the regulations will work. If, you know, can we go from Zoom one month to in-person the next month, or do we have to always have some type of video, live video, which, you know, those are the things I think that have to be worked out because if we have to have some type of live video, then it becomes, you know, only one room in town hall is capable of it. And then it, you know, could become a scheduling conflict. And so, yeah, I mean, I, I'm hoping we have some guidance in the next two months because it, I think it's changes in April of this coming of you know, this year. Okay. Any other? We made in person. Some of us have never met each other in person. Um. Yeah. I mean, that, that's the thing that I would say about it is that there's this, I agree with you on the, the convenience factor is huge. And that at the same time, there is this kind of, you know, stiltedness that uh, yeah. I, would love, I would love to have a schedule where it was maybe two, two Zoom meetings and one in person to just kind of, you know, bring that, that, that flow back to it. But um, I understand that it's, um, it's up to the state to figure out how to move forward. So, right, it may not. Yeah, it may. You know, they may say that it has to all go back in person. Right. Um, yeah. So we'll see. Okay. Um. Any other unanticipated items? Okay. Uh. So we need to establish our next meeting date. Do we have it on the books? My calendar open. Do we have a meeting on the calendar, Nate? I'm not sure we do. You know, if if you know if, if the owner of 260 Levert Road submits an application, you know, we have to hold the hearing within so many days. And so um do we you know, want how we, when we determine it to be significant. So I mean, I don't, you know, I don't know what, um, you know, if Wednesdays are usually not the typical meeting day or if, what, you know, what would be preferable? I think we've been meeting Wednesdays pretty regularly, unless I'm, unless I'm. Since last fall, I would say, right? Yeah. Yeah. Robin? yeah. I think that's right. Yeah. Why don't we pick, is the 15th good? Uh, February? Yeah. I may have another meeting that night. 22nd? That would be fine. Yeah. Will, will that work if, um, do we need to have a, another date in mind if we get a demolition application or? I can't do the 22nd. Okay. Let's go back to the 8th. How about the 8th? Go with me. Works for me. Let's do the 8th, um, at least tentatively, and um, yeah. we'll see. Yeah, what I mean, it's, yeah, would we, if we couldn't do the 15th with the 14th work, I'm just saying, I'm thinking that if, yeah. for instance, say yeah. we say the 260 Levitt Road applications complete in a week, and then we determine we need to hold the hearing, we need two weeks notice. Um, and the eighth is a little, you know, is actually really, you know, is, is difficult just because of the timing to get everything. Right. So if we meet uh, the eighth, we may end up having to meet I, again. I can't do board. Tuesdays. Anymore yeah. after the 24th. Ever. Yeah. yeah. What about the 16th? I 16th, I could do. Yeah. Yeah. That works with everybody. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Okay, good. Yeah. And that'll work too. Then, if we do receive an application, that could also probably become a public hearing night. So, could, okay. we could have you know, do both. Okay. All right, so the 16th uh, of February, that's a Thursday at 6.30. Great. Good okay. job, Robin. Oh, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks for bearing with me, everybody. <laughs> Great work. 
<laughs> um, uh, so I think I don't need to call a vote for us to adjourn. I just get to adjourn, right? That's my one power. <laughs> I think so, yeah. <laughs> okay, so if we're all if we're all generally in agreement, uh, I will adjourn this meeting of the Historic Commission at 8.32 p.m. on the 11th and wish you all a pleasant evening. Thanks, everyone. Bye, everybody. Bye. 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 Bye.